The Falcon Punch is maybe one of the most famous fiery fists in all fighting games, but just how fast would a fist like this have to fly in order to generate flames? Let's get technical. The aforementioned feat is of course the signature move of Captain Falcon. It's just a punch, but it's a punch that's so forceful, comics and video games imply it can create flames simply by moving through the air to an opponent's face at some ridiculous velocity. But how can a fist moving through the air generate flames? What is even igniting? Why does the Kirby player always spam down B? Let's begin. Three, two, one. Go! First, without any obvious source of ignition, it's gonna be the movement of the Falcon Punch itself which needs to generate a lot of heat. At first thought, it seems very unlikely that movement through air alone could create such a blaze of fury. That is, until you see footage like this, which is an astronaut's eye view of an Orion capsule re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And let's freeze it right there, a giant red and yellowish plume of plasma. Hmm, now let's add Captain Falcon to this. Hmm, obviously something very similar is going on, and that similar something is called aerodynamic heating. At lower velocities moving through the air, like lower than the speed of sound, you go through the air's particles. And on average, because you are losing energy to those particles as you impact them, you lose heat. This is convection, and it's why something like a fan cools you down. However, if you start going a lot faster, like above Mach 2.2, 2.2 times the speed of sound, 1700 miles per hour, those air molecules hitting your body start to bunch up. They can't really get out of the way of each other. And when air bunches up, it gets a lot hotter. If you keep moving at this velocity, a shockwave of air particles will start to form, which will transfer a lot of heat to whatever object is moving through the atmosphere. If you're an aircraft or a spacecraft that hasn't taken into consideration this heating effect, something very, very bad can start to happen to you. Okay, stop. Whew. Too hot. Whoa, hey, Kirby, come on. Actually, speaking of falling rocks, Aerodynamic heating and adiabatic compression, if you want to get technical about it, are the biggest reasons why something like a rock falling from space, if it's smaller, will never make it to Earth. NASA figures that the majority of objects that are less than 25 meters across moving through the Earth's atmosphere at orbital speed will never make it to the ground because they will encounter such significant aerodynamic heating. They will heat up, form plasma, the objects will start to crack, and then eventually they will rip themselves apart under these forces and create that classic shooting star-like effect. Objects can and do move so fast through the Earth's atmosphere that they basically burst into flames. So now our question is, how fast does a fist have to fly to do that? Yeah. How? How fast? How fast is it going to be? To figure that out, we'll have to go from Super Smash Brothers to Super Maths Brothers. It works, shut up. We mentioned space capsules burning through Earth's atmosphere before, and that's exactly what we're going to consider when calculating the velocity of Captain Falcon's punch. Because, I mean, if you think about it, what is a fast-moving fist if not just a re-entry capsule for your hand bones? By considering Captain Falcon's fist like a re-entry capsule, we can use similar math and then come within some percentage oh, of an actual value. Derby, come on! So here is an experimentally derived equation that the FAA uses when considering the heating per square meter on some re-entering spacecraft or an aircraft moving really, really fast through the air. The heating rate they found depends on some empirical constant and also depends on the velocity of the object moving through the air, the density of that air, and the radius of the nose cone of whatever is moving through the air. Now that we have an equation like this, we can solve for velocity, but before we do that, we actually first need to know what is being heated up and how much heat it takes to do that. Falcon punch! 
It is satisfying, I'll give Cap that. You gotta give him that, it is satisfying. It is satisfying, I'll give the Cap that. Whatever is igniting, it has to be something on or around Captain Falcon's hand, right? So what if it was his glove? If his hand is constantly moving through the air fast enough to produce flames, then it makes sense that his glove could act as some kind of protection. If Falcon's gloves acted as some kind of heat shield, then it would make sense that they would occasionally burst into flame, like we see the heat shield burst into flame in that NASA capsule re-entry footage. So now we need to know how much heat energy it would take to raise some mass of, let's say, glove leather to its ignition point. We can look up the specific heat of leather. We can then look up the auto ignition temperature of leather, which is around 200 degrees Celsius, but we write it for this equation in Kelvin. I then used my own hand's dimensions to estimate using the density of leather, the amount of mass that we have to heat up to this fiery temperature. And plugging all this into this MCAT equation, you get around two thousand joules, which isn't particularly impressive. However, a Falcon Punch gets fiery in just a single frame of the original N64 game. Combine this with the fact that we need all of this heating to take place over a very small surface area and we get an enormous heating value like 20 million watts per square meter. This would be like subjecting your fist to 20,000 times the intensity of sunlight. Oh. Finally, we can plug our numbers into our hot, hot spacecraft equation and solve for velocity. Do that and we get the true velocity of a Falcon Punch, 2,700 meters or two miles per second above Mach 7 beyond the escape velocity of the dang moon. And this huge velocity is good because it's above Mach 2.2 where we know aerodynamic heating does come into play. If Captain Falcon did a real life Falcon Punch with this velocity, when he moved his fist, it would be moving faster than just about anything else on the planet has ever moved. Crazy! That's what you get for floating around the whole time. We have a heating value now and a velocity figure, but these don't immediately tell us just how powerful a Falcon Punch would be. For that, we need to go from Super Smash Brothers to Super Math. As we estimated, a Falcon Punch goes from stationary fist to fiery in just a fraction of a second. Do the math and use the frame rate from the original game, and this equates to a ludicrous acceleration. If you compare it to the acceleration due to the gravity on Earth, you get a value for just the motion of Captain Falcon's fist of over 8,000 Gs worth of acceleration. Very few biological things move this quickly with this alacrity, but one of them might be the Captain Falcon of the sea. With an actual punch that can accelerate at nearly 10 and a half thousand G, the mantis shrimp is a rainbow colored murder crustacean that you probably heard about before. It can fling its clubby claws through the water so quickly that they create little cavitation bubbles, shock waves, and little bursts of light. Knowing that acceleration is what makes a mantis shrimp punch so dangerous, I think we can say the mantis shrimp should definitely be in Super Smash Brothers. But back to Captain Falcon. Even though we have velocity and acceleration values for his punch, we still have not calculated how powerful it can possibly be. And I think there's some confusion here when people do calculations like these for fictional characters. We don't want raw velocity, we actually want force, how hard Captain Falcon can hit. Right before impact, a Falcon Punch will have a lot of kinetic energy. It is moving at Mach 7 and it's on fire. <laughs> More specifically, estimating the mass of Captain Falcon's fist, this puts seven and a half million joules behind his hand. About the same amount of energy that's in a kilogram of TNT in its chemical bonds, about the same amount of kinetic energy that's in a car when it's moving at highway speeds. When this impacts a foe, it's gonna do physical work on that opponent, and we can use a relationship between work and kinetic energy to find force. I told you that's what would happen if you kept spamming B. Ah! Oh. Work is equivalent to a force applied over a distance, but it's also equivalent to a change in kinetic energy. So now let's bring all of our numbers together. If we assume that when Captain Falcon impacts an enemy, his fist comes to a stop maybe within the length of his own fist, like he's only punching this much into something, which I think is reasonable, then we get the true power 
of a Falcon Punch, and that is 74 million Newtons. This hardly makes sense for a humanoid to create. Why? Well, because if our calculations are close, when Captain Falcon punches you, it's gonna feel like this. Falcon punch! Yeah. A realistic Falcon punch would be twice as forceful, twice as a Saturn V rocket taking off on your face. This is the power of a Falcon punch, surely enough to send another fighter into the sky. Game set. If our math is correct, a real Falcon Punch would be ridiculous. A fiery fist moving at above Mach 7 with the energy of a few pounds of TNT impacting people's faces like a Saturn V rocket taking off. This would undoubtedly make for a real Super Smash. Because science. Kirby mains. I am a Kirby main myself, by the way, but that's not important. You know, the nose cone shape of a re-entering spacecraft is actually really important, and it's not what you expect. You might expect uh, something to be very aerodynamic, very pointy when it enters the atmosphere. That's good, right? Well, not necessarily. When you're entering the atmosphere, that shock wave of heated air that we were talking about before gets really close to the metal or the material of that spacecraft when it's shaped like this. In fact, most re-entering spacecraft have a nose cone that is slanted, that kind of looks like the edge of a circle. And that's because when this happens, it's more blunt. It's circular or harder edge. It's more blunt and this forces the shock wave to be separate from the spacecraft so it's not really touching. So that's really important. The shape matters when you're going that fast. And thanks for watching, Chrissy. <laughs>